keep your net worth. And it, just for any background, I'm not getting commissions on any of these. One, one guy is a friend and, you know, uh, I'm not. The, the friend, if you want to do some background reading on, on English football and what's gone on before, this one on the left is about the finances of English football. And this is one by a friend of mine. Um, didn't write it for his own. It, all the money from this pretty much goes to charity. It explains about the finances in football and how different things work on player deals and how clubs work on the finances and so on and so forth. The second one along is quite an old book, but it will give you the history of how the business side of English football has moved forward. Uh, there's some very interesting stories in there about how, how some agents come about. Um, Daniel Gee's book, The Done Deal, will give you a, a massive overview and touches on football in other areas as well, it touch on the regulations. And this one on the end, in one way I hate promoting it, in another way, it will, there's no book out that gives you a truer picture of the way the football agency work, world works and the dark side of it in England. The, seat, the secret agents, and people have said to me, well, this, this is all made up, it's all fiction. No, it's not. Um, it might put you off. I hope it makes you a bit more aware of, of what you've got to deal with. And, but what I would say is that not everybody is like some of the characters in this book. There's some very genuine hard-working, solid people in English football. Um, this, this paints a picture that everybody's bad. They're not, but be aware of it. And I think that's it, Michael. I think I've made everybody suffer enough. Right. Is he there? I've scared him off. Oh. Oh, he's there. Sorry, I've missed the logo. Okay, he's still, he's still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, Jonathan, thank you. So, I will want to ask, how, how can agents do his business in England? I mean, the newly licensed agents in Africa. How can they do their business in England? Um, yeah. I, I think the primary thing is that there's a lot of um, agents who fly between um, England and Africa and well they were until this pandemic hit um, there's a lot of pe people go and watch matches um, out there there's agents who are rep who are registered in both territories who are established uh, some are good uh some are have questionable practices um and i think it's a matter of getting talking to them and also the, the english clubs do send scouts out there so you know if you're looking at building that network even though you don't have a player in a certain match it might be an under 19s match it might be an under 23s match it might be between the top two teams in the state or in the country go along you, because you don't know who's there and you can build it that way. In terms of getting those players into England, if you think it's viable, I think the primary thing is on top of those agents is building up scouting contacts. Because as I said, with the governing okay. body, with the governing body endorsements, 
a lot of agents in England won't have the time or the resources to invest in a relatively unknown player. If that makes sense. Um, and the other thing as well, like I said about the governing body endorsements, is that if you've got somebody you don't think is going to make it, look at a stepping stone, what, what I call a stepping stone of a country, a country that is a bit more lenient, will bring that player through and then hopefully open up the doors to um, England and other markets. Like, the, like French football is, is an, it's a different world to, to work in as, as is all the nations, but look for those stepping stones. As far as when you come to actually work in England, first thing is make sure you're registered. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as the era of uh, intermediary is about to go down, and the new there will be going to be a new approach. I mean, the coming of the FIFA agent. Do. In multiple countries, in multiple nations. Right. You, you, you a bit on that. So, if I if I try and repeat and you confirm whether it was a question, um, you're talking about the change to the intermediary regulations back to the FIFA licensed agents approach. Yes. Okay. <sighs> Not something new. What should have never gone in 2015, in my opinion. Um, yeah. I think we will see a lot of resetting. I think you will see, be careful what I'm saying here. I think we will see that there will be an overall licensing system. I think countries like England, and I'm pretty sure France, and I think Germany as well, will maintain their own accreditation. So it will either be a process that you register with FIFA through your national association, which I think is most likely, or the fact that we will have a central FIFA license and then you get accreditation in certain countries. If I use this as an example, before 2015, when we had registered intermediaries, we had licensed agents and various guises before that. Um, for operating in England, you had to get permit. If you were registered in, say, Nigeria or South Africa or Australia or wherever, you could register in those countries, but you still had to get permission to operate in England because that was what the English FA said. They had another layer on top that you had to get permission as a registered overseas agent. Um, with what FIFA are proposing, the large majority of it, I'm a huge supporter of. I think it's needed, I think it's necessary, and I hope that it will encourage more good practice. Do I think it'll disrupt those people who are successful on bad practice? No, I don't, not at the moment. Um, it's encouraging, but I, I don't think I, I welcome it because FIFA are taking responsibility again a bit for it. And, you know, the, we'll wait and see, but I'm encouraged by it. Okay. Do we have anyone with questions? Can I have a question? Yeah, your name, I'm okay. going. Mr. Jonathan, uh, your presentation is quite clear about uh, business in England. Yeah. But uh, to my understanding, uh, it means 
once you are not registered with the FA in England, automatically you don't have the right to work in England. Is that what it means? Right. This, this is where the complications come in because okay. by the letter of the regulations is that if you are doing business in England, i.e. with an English club or a player registered in England, you have to be registered, okay? The scenario could be that you are representing a player who is moving from a country where you're registered to England. Now, in that situation, until he's actually registered in England, he's not playing in England. So, <laughs> you know, the, the argument is there whether you need to be registered. If you are representing a player in England who's signed and is in England, yes, you need to be registered. If you are representing a club in England who is signing a player, you need to be registered in England. Okay. okay. The, the, um, one more, yeah, one more question. What happened when you have a player in England requesting for an intermediary outside England to represent, for example, in like Middle East? So what do you do? No. What you could do is if you are, and we go back to the situation where somebody might be brokering a deal, mm -hmm. you could be rep representing the club in the okay. Middle East. Okay. Then the argument could be made because you're representing somebody outside of England, you don't need to be registered in England. And that, that is the situation. If I'm working, uh, and the other guys might, might reiterate this, if I'm registered in England and I, I'm not registered in Spain, I will work with a trusted person who I work with in Spain to get that side of things ticked and crossed off. The French authorities, and it's actually in their in federal law that you have to work if we are working any element in france you have to work with somebody who has authority to work in france as an agent because football agents in france is rec recognized as federal law it's a, it's an occupation it's part of the legal process okay okay thank you there is a question okay yeah, I, okay. I, I have a quick question. Okay. Your name, okay. please. First of all, I really want to thank you for that elaborate presentation. It really took time. I enjoyed every bit of it. Thank you. Now, Hello. I want to find out. Uh, let me even start from the foundation. Is it... Hello? Is, Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Is it, is, it, is it allowed for somebody who is outside of England without a resident permit without a, a citizenship, a completely like, I'm in Nigeria now. I, I think I only travel to England on tourism, but I, can I actually register as an intermediary in England without a resident permit, without any kind of uh, legal documentation in England? Is that, is it allowed? Can you be a registered intermediary in England? Yes. Without being resident? Um. I would say yes. Oh, my God, this is a tough one. I'm not an immigration lawyer. Um, <laughs> um, um, I would say yes. I think it's possible. I, it's not possible. I don't think, I don't think you would get any hurdles from the FA in the registration process where your problem would actually come to do some work. So, yes, you could register, but no, you couldn't do any work. If that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Because what, what then will be the whole point of registering when you won't be able to travel to England, when you will be able to reside in England? You're, you're talking about work permits here. Yes. Because, right. for instance, I'm I'm not an immigration lawyer. Okay. I will plead the Fifth Amendment here and say I am not. Uh, actually, I'm not American, so I can't even plead the amendment. So. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, I can help you a little bit about that because I'm not staying in Africa. That is not possible because you need a document for you to be able to live in that country before yes. you can apply 
something no 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 what i'm saying is the question was can you apply to be a registered intermediary in england yes resident you, no not residency as i said i'm not an immigration lawyer okay as you know you would have to have a sponsor for a start a player's sponsor would be a club but you could register as an intermediary in england the problem is that you wouldn't be able to work so it would be a pretty pointless exercise if you wanted to go through the process of being a registered intermediary in england yes you could be the fact is you couldn't work okay next question samson galaxy your name Oh, sorry about that. My name is Kola. Um, I'm a young intermediary from Nigeria. Um, I'm also a lawyer. Yes, yeah, so um, good one, Michael. Um, you've done an impressive job so far. And to um, Paddy and Jonathan, uh, it's been quite an insightful interactive session. So my question is, um, there are tools available to agents that we that I've come across, and one of them is um, Transform Market and um, Y Scout. So my question would be, how do we harness or um, utilize these platforms, or should we reckon with any of them at all, or how helpful can they be? I just continue, Michael. Jonathan, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, my opinion is, I, this is just personal opinion. I've got a lot of time for Y Scout. I think it's a very good resource. Is it 100% accurate? Possibly not. It's better than it used to be because, of course, Y Scout is now owned by a separate organization. There's other resources that you can use as well. As far as transfer market goes, um i would say you can possibly believe one in every five things on there um i don't think it's a very reliable resource i think it's fine for doing initial research but if you approach anybody of standing in a professional club and you base your presentation of a player and your your justification of a player based on what you've got on transfer market you're again you're devaluing yourself if you back it up with stuff off of things like y scout um and there used to be one called the soccer association the other guys might might use other ones as well um i think you're in, in far better stead um if you were to focus your efforts on one or the other i would 90 percent of your time focus on what you see on y scout and 10 percent look at transfer market Sorry, transfer market, but that's just my opinion. Okay. Um, Thank you. Jonathan, from one of our Facebook users. It's for you, Jonathan. So please, what is that with English FA through online registration? How do I confirm that the registration has gone through? Right. The easiest way to confirm it is to send them an email or to phone them because I know they're, they're not the quickest on, publish, on updating the list. They're meant to do it. I've never understood why they just do a, a static list and they used to have a database where it updated straight away. Um, and you could search the name of an agent. The only way to be sure is to contact them, to ask for confirmation that it's gone through. You should have a confirmation receipt when you're registered because you're paying for it. Um, and then you would normally expect once every month, typically they will update the list online. There is a list online of all registered intermediaries in England. Um, and to do with their status with regards to minors. That is the, those are the only ways to check now. Um, contact them, but check the list. And I, having been on the receiving end of not having my details on there up to date, which has 
hampered me in some ways. If you get chance, go back and check every other month, every every two months, go and check because uh, my record was not correct on there, to which I've still got a grievance with the FA over. Yeah, Kola, you are on. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, I was going to ask a follow-on question about um, what what would be the best um, platform then? Okay, I I understand that we should. You you Jonathan mentioned that we should go through preferably um head of recruitment. We should start lower with clubs if we are having troubles reaching out to the higher ups in terms of the football hierarchy. Um, other than emails, um, do you think that it is professional to reach out through maybe LinkedIn or um, Instagram, for example, through social media? Some people find that appalling However, if you are going to be persistent, would you advise um, anyone struggling to make contact with um, anyone in the football pyramid to go through that route? Thank you. Jonathan. All right. Um, I think some medium i think it depends on the person as well i i know i personally wouldn't reach out to anybody on facebook or twitter or any element like that you know it, uh, this this is a business element so i i for me personally linkedin is the best method outside of that because it, there's some form of quality and quality yeah. control what I would say, don't damage your reputation. The, the old saying, you only get one chance to make a first impression. And really fine tune it. You, you know, look at the person, understand the person if you're reaching out to them. Make sure the quality is a content. And with a lot of people in agency in the football world, time is short and, you know, they want quality. And by saying... There's got to be something for them from it that makes them sit up and think this person's worth knowing, this person's the liaison with. So it's it's using it in that way. I don't think it's any any different to a lot of other businesses, to tell you the truth. And I, but the one thing is with LinkedIn, and I always try to do, like I talked about personalizing emails. Don't just press the connect button on LinkedIn with somebody you never met before. Actually attach a note to it and say the reason why you're trying to connect and that you might get a bit more interest. Um, you know, it, I, I think LinkedIn's a good platform. Pe people might have different opinions. Um, I typically won't take any sort of communication via Facebook because I, I don't see it as a qualified platform um in that sense of business and professional uh, i just don't and you know that's just me e everybody's different some people might be different i don't know what the other guys think thank you jonathan so i think peter is and we have about 15 minutes left for today's episode so I think let's bring in Peter now. So I think he, we have something to say on the questions asked before. Then he give us his presentation. Fifteen minutes left. No, um, yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, I've already presented several times to the guys on this platform, so I'll keep my presentation very short. I really appreciate Jonathan and Patty making time from their very busy schedule and answering 
a lot of questions and providing great insights into the business. Um, my presentation is more about tips. I've decided instead of getting away, even though I'm a lawyer, a football lawyer, I'm focusing a little bit more on tips as well in the international market, and I'll go through that. Um, the one thing I will say that was mentioned earlier, the other platform that's very useful is Instat because they have more leagues than Scout does. Um, so Instat is a very a good platform as well if you want to um, promote your players and get um, research and information. So that's the other platform I would recommend. I'll get straight into my, I've only got 10, 15 minutes. I'll get straight into my presentation. 80% of agent fees in the world that are paid by clubs or players are paid in the five big leagues, England, Spain, France, Germany, um, and Italy, and Portugal, those six countries. So agents who work within those environments have access to the most fees. And that's something that anyone who wants to get involved in this industry sort of needs to sort of understand. Um, the other thing is, in terms of the growth of player positions, in terms of players, there hasn't been a mass... There hasn't been a massive growth in the um, in the marketplace, other than the MLS or Canada having new professional leagues. The jobs for players are very scarce. Okay. Um, as mentioned by, sorry, as mentioned by um, the previous presenters, there are player representation is a very difficult, precarious business. For example, in Belgium, there's 500 agents. So that makes it very, very tough. But there's one quote that I want to share. Um, a Belgium agent, a very close friend of mine, is also a football lawyer, said about agency. It's not a complicated job as an agent, but it's the most complicated job in the world. And that resonates to what kind of business we're involved in. Now, I'll go basically into tips. We mentioned representative agreements and mandates. Fundamentally, the best thing is to have a representative agreement. The mandate is only good for a player that maybe I would say is a bit older and is only looking for a, uh, a final deal is well known. You may be able to work with that parameters. With mandates, the best use is when you have a rep agreement and you're giving a mandate to another agent in another country. That's probably the best um, use of a mandate. Now, in terms of tips as being an agent, you need to be on top of your information about your players. Make sure you know the player's contract status all the time. What's happening with the contract? Are bonuses being paid? When are they becoming free? Uh, is there a transfer or release fee? All those things you must be across. Um, also with younger players, and we have this in Australia, in Asia, players... Um, the training compensation. How do you deal with training compensation, especially in Europe, if the clubs are at a high level, a high tier, because we've got, um, depending, it comes down to the buying club. Do you know how much those clubs are going to pay? So you need to know where your player stands in terms of training compensation. Now, negotiating contracts. Um, we mentioned some tools about contacting clubs or uh, football directors or agents. WhatsApp is probably another tool that um, if you want to contact someone, I would recommend also WhatsApp if you're able to get their number. Um, be persistent or try to ring them, but WhatsApp is an important tool. Now, when we look at, when we look at agents, I think we always need to self-reflect and say, what type of agent am I? Um, because all of the different agents have different characteristics and for me, a good agent and a tip that really is important in the agent, um, Jonathan mentioned fixer, which a lot of people put out that they're fixers, is problem solver. You solve problems for the player, for the club, um, for the situation, for the um, being the contract, being whatever problem the player has. You've got to be a problem solver. In terms of um, Jonathan also mentioned being a scout, it's important to be across the data, the data of the player, the data of the clubs that you're trying to deal with. What type of players do they like? What type of style of game? So always got to be across these things. Keep yourself informed. Rapport. You've got to have, this is a people's business. This is a relationship business. You need to have rapport. 
And that grow, uh, we mentioned trust. Um, Paddy mentioned trust before, but a rapport is also a valuable asset because you develop rapport with different football directors, scouts, players, coaches. Very important. As an agent, it comes with experience. And I think an important thing about it is finding your voice and your confidence in believing yourself and saying, I've done one deal, I've done two, I'm building experience. But find your own voice. Don't try to mimic uh, other agents all the time. The other thing is keep track record of your deals and your introductions and your successes because that will give you con confidence going ahead. Um, we mentioned conferences. I think conferences are important for networking. You know, if you're starting out in the game, you, you probably need to get to Europe. You need to either go to uh, subject to the pandemic to go to a player agents conference and maybe Scouts hosting or Instat or some of the player associations. We know European Football Agent Association's had some conferences recently. If it's, it is worth your while because there's two things. Paddy and Paddy's travelled a lot. Um, Jonathan's in England's got better access. I'm in Australia as well. But I know if I go to one conference, I can meet 300 agents or 200 clubs or 100 in the one spot. So investment-wise, it's, it's much more um, efficient than going to country to country, especially when you don't have a lot of money. Okay. Um, be organised. As Paddy and Jonathan mentioned, respond promptly to emails. Under-promise and over-deliver. Very, very important. Have your template and clauses ready. So you've got your contracts, you've got clauses. Have you got a release clause? Have you got a transfer clause drafted? Build your IP as an agent. Very important. That's what distinguishes you from other agents. But not only that, if you're known as someone who's got good IP, other agents will come to you, in, 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 especially in Africa when maybe there's not a lot of experience. You can sell that IP and say, yes, I'll lend you my clause or my draft contract but you need to pay me. So you can build that sort of relationship. Um, we mentioned networking. Um, always have a spreadsheet, very simple. Everything you're dealing with, every project, every player, have a spreadsheet with that and update it constantly every week. What have you been doing? Which player you're looking at? Which club you've contacted? And follow up. You need to be organised that way. You just can't um, have one notebook, have a spreadsheet. Um, basically, the, 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 the important thing here is um, being in Africa or being in Australia or being in Asia, we need to link up with stronger agents, and that includes in Europe. And as I mentioned before, going to a conference or trying to develop a relationship and trying to get on a Zoom call with some Euro, um, European agents. The key thing is, and this is the agent's business, basically, you've got to have the product. You've got to have the players. You've got to have the young players. You've got to have, being in Africa, that should give you some confidence because in Africa, you have a lot of great players coming through. We see that even in Australia, as Paddy mentioned, the African generation that's migrated here, are some of our best players now, we see that in England and we see, we're seeing that throughout Europe. But you need to basically focus on that. And um, I think that's, that's very important, sometimes very overlooked. Now, I'll deal with a few things about clubs, players, and other agents. Um, get, get your first deal with a club, you get trust. If you give a club a good player first time round, you build trust. You build the relationship. Um, that, that is very important. In Asia, for instance, you give them a bad player, you lose trust. So it's very, very important to get things right from the outset. Um, um, basically, also, when players you're sending overseas, each country is a little bit different. England supports players a lot. They have player care. Most clubs do, and they'll help you transition the player. But if you're in other countries, even in Italy or even Germany, the support is less. So that's where you sometimes, if you do send a player, you need a representative on the ground, another local agent. Um, how do you deal with players? With the, um, most players are insecure about their career. Most players don't reach a point where they financially secure their future. So it's very, very difficult. But you also have to be how you deal with players and also parents. I know very 
In Africa, it's very parents play a very big role, as do the uncles, as do the family. You need to be the driver of the relationship for the player. So you need to manage those expectations with everyone else who's dealing with the player. That's very important. Um, if you, but you have to also be firm. If you let too many people influence the player, get in the head of the player, that can wreck your deal or your promotion of the player. So be wary of that. You must be firm. I talked about confidence and I talked about um, um, presenting players. You've got to be firm that you are the specialist. You're the person promoting the player. You're the agent. And, and with family and all that, you need to ensure that they know where they fit in that picture. Um, with players, it's about trust. And Patty mentioned this. But 95% of players that come to you um, are word of mouth. So ethics, very important to have that relationship, transparency, that you can do deals. Reputation, very important. Um, your role as an agent is to give good habits. You must have good habits yourself to, for those habits to be, flown, um, to be given to the player. I think that's very um, important. Now, in terms of dealing with other agents, um, as I mentioned before, investing um, is very important in relationships. If you can get an opportunity when you travel to sit for a coffee one-on-one -on -one with a local agent. I, I've done, I did this when I was in a younger age and say, I want one hour of your time. Uh, give me a QA. and a I'll ask all the questions. Some agents will give you that time. So you've got to be persistent when you're traveling to a new country to try to make those meetings. Now, as an agent, you also need to have um, your talent identification and recruitment of players down pat. What type of players do you want? Have that documented. Do you want players with technical skills, tactical, athleticism, physical power, mental toughness? I would say one of the characteristics with players is that they must have a good character when you choose players to work with and they're coachable, very important, and focus on those qualities as well when you're recruiting because you're just like a scout you're just like a club. You're recruiting players to your portfolio. So you need to have players of good character that won't go against you when a decision needs to be made. Now, tips in relation to negotiating a new contract. Sorry, I'm going a bit fast there, but I don't have much time and I just want to go through these things. Listen to what the client wants. Number one, you're the agent, they're the principal. In, um, you can with clubs you can always make the first offer but you make the first offer based on the fact that you reference other players so when a club's interested in your player you make the first offer but you you say i am this offer is based on what other players of similar types have been offered by this club so do your research um, you don't wait for the club to always make an offer unless you have top players and they approach you when you're trying to push players through the door and you don't have the stable of top players, sometimes you have to make um, that first offer. Um, you've got to be wary that sometimes clubs, especially in Asia, um, can go behind your back. So you must have a firm relationship with the player. Um, it's important with advice. Um, there are two things. The financial, players think by going overseas they'll get more money versus the sporting. If a player's playing week in, week out in the top league, Nigeria, Ghana, Egypt, South Africa, a lot of games in those leagues at a younger age is the selling point. And you, and you need to be firm with players and say, if you play two seasons of that, then it's time to go overseas. If you go too young sometimes, um, it doesn't work out. There are a lot of unemployed players out there. So that's um, very important. Always plan before the window, six months before transfer window, six months before. Um, always do your planning. Now, I know with um, when you're working with other agents um, and you want agents help in other countries, their first priority is their own players. They'll only look at your players if they've got time or if that player is very good. So if you do a lot of pre-planning and you've done a lot of the work, a lot of the research, You've got the videos for the player. You've got the CV updated. You've got the contract status. That will help the other agent who's overseas to push your player. So 
think about that. Do a lot of the work beforehand. Um, and different countries. Um, in Italy, a lot of times the final decision is with the president. And the president will be a lot of presidents in Italy, club presidents, a lot of bravado. So you've got to be ready for that negotiation. In Turkey, agents' um, fees are always a club to try and reduce the agent fee. So just be mindful of that, that when you're dealing with clubs, in, 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 um, that they may try always to reduce the agent's fee. In Asia, including China and Japan, um, they're slow. They make decisions slower. They need to go up a hierarchy to make decisions. It may not be the football director. So you need to know the club dynamics when you're making the deals. Um, probably the most professional are the, and not because Jonathan's on the call or Paddy deals a lot with England, the English football directors or club are probably the most um, professional in dealing with the agent and telling them where the player stands. But a lot of other countries, you need to understand the cultural differences. Um, with America now, and I, and I would emphasise, I know it's very hard from Africa, but America is a market because passports don't matter as much in America as other countries. And that's where a lot of your younger players, and I'm not saying to go through a college scholarship, but there should be a push there that a lot of your players, because we know USL, MLS, that's all really providing good opportunities. So that's something where I know we're all attracted to Europe, but as Patty said, the MLS could be the biggest, second biggest league in 10, 20 years, maybe earlier, maybe later. But African players, I think there's a good synergy and a market there. So that's one thing that um, as African agents, really need to focus on relationships with football directors and um, coaches and agents in America. Very, very important. And I would say this, from my experience, I think the Americans are a little bit more easier to have those interviews and chats and Zoom calls. Um, so don't discount America as a market for your players. Um, the other thing is, as an agent, you really need to, um, if you're working in the Nigerian league, Ghanaian league, Senegal league, you need to um, promote that league in your discussions and, and, and raise what's going on in those leagues and what type of players are going out there. So when you're approaching European clubs or um, American clubs or Asian clubs, you need, sometimes we discount our leagues, but I think that's something you need to focus on. Um, the last things uh, I would say is that, and Michael, he could be one, Michael Sudeke, I mean, could be one of the catalysts here. I think that down the track, you need to bring a conference to Africa where you bring scouts, you bring coaches, you bring clubs, could be to Lagos, could be to South Africa, could be to Ghana, Accra, doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, bring people to yourself, set up a conference, get clubs, get um, football directors down there, get all you agents to promote yourself and see what talent's on offer. We know that a lot of scouts, a lot of agents come to Africa, but I think you really need to set up something that could be with the African Agents Union, the new one, or the Nigerian agents, but really you need to set up a conference, bring them to you. Um, that's something as a long-term objective. But there's some of the things I would say in terms of tips. Um, sorry, I was a bit fast, but I know running out of time, but those are the things that you need to focus on. Never sell yourself short because at the end of the day, African players, just like South American players, are in demand because of the physical and other characteristics. You're in a strong market. But it's a, the key here is how do you make the most of that market? And you've got to be a little bit in, innovative, but you also got to be, what's a, be dealing with relationships and always trying to learn ways to improve and get, get across decision makers. So that's my tips in, a, um, I'm, in, in 10, 15 minutes. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yeah, I would like, I would want to unmute the, the three speakers, Paddy, Jonathan, and Peter. Please unmute yourself for the final section. So if any one of us have questions, we can put it on now. 
the three speakers are available to answer the question. Okay, I have a question. Go ahead, your name and go ahead. Yakubu, my name is Yakubu again. Um, okay. My question is to Peter for, so far. Uh, I want you to clarify more on the agency fee because so many agents doesn't understand the difference between the percentage of the player and the agency fee. So I, if I want a brief description. Okay. The age, as in the commission fee? The commission, is that um, your Okay. Commission. Okay. The, 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 the aging commission is basically uh, normally the player needs to pay in your contract, you need to have set out a fee, a commission. Okay. The average international range is about 5, 5.8 5 to 6.8% is the average range around the world. Okay. The maximum is probably 10%. But for younger players, it could be as low as 3% because you're trying to help them. They're not going to earn much. And you're also trying to earn their trust. The key is this. Certain markets require, and this is where you need to do your research. Certain markets or leagues allow for the player that has to pay you. For example, in Australia, a player has to come from the player. The clubs won't pay fees. Um, in other markets, in, um, then the clubs can pay the fee. Um, the five or ten percent, whatever it is, but it's case by case. Different markets um, important. The important thing is this: when you do a deal with a club, you should get the player to authorize um, the club to pay you. But that makes it easier for you, for the club, uh, and for the player. However, there's one thing that we forget about commissions: tax. You also need to do a little bit of research on the country because if the player pays you or the club pays you, it, uh, each country deals with that commission differently. So there's an impact. But what I will say is for a younger player, 3%. For good player, 10%, you know, um, but um, it depends. Each market's different. The average international is 6.8% commission payable to an agent. Thank you, Yakubu. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, do you have anything to add to it, Paddy? No, uh, exactly as Peter said, obviously you're building a business so uh, with younger players. Uh, I mean, generally speaking with young players setting out at the very beginning when they're very earning very little money, even though my contract provides for a commission, um, I actually don't collect any commission from them. I prefer the young player to save enough money to be able to buy a car to drive himself to training and back to be able to pay rents and etc. So it's, it's in my interests, medium to longer term for that player to develop. And these are all things that help that player to develop. If he's comfortable in his environment, he's going to perform better when he goes to training. Um, so as part of that high performance environment that he gets at a club, his outside life, the more comfortable that becomes, the better chance that player will have to succeed. So I will get paid my commission later on when he's successful, when he signs a senior professional contract and when he moves from club to club and grows his career. Um, so I always take a medium to long-term view of my business. Um, I always tell the players when I speak to them that I'm signing that I try to picture what their life looks like at 36 years of age and I work back from there. Um, so at 36, I want them to be financially secure. I want them to have a career that they achieved to the highest level they could possibly achieve. Um, I want them to have good memories because, again, it's a short journey. You know, there's a lot of life for these players. If we all retired at 35 and we live to 85, we've spent more of our life not playing football than being involved in football by a long way. So I always take a longer term view of my clients. And so at the earlier ages, although my contract is standard and, and it's again, everyone's different. You can run your business whichever way you want. I don't change my contract for anybody because I'll get mums, dads, uncles, or they might get a, a lawyer who's not even in sports who will come along and issue me with a raft of changes to my representation agreement. But if I charge a Premier League player, if he's willing to sign a contract, my representation agreement, I'm not prepared to then go and chop and change it for everyone else. 
So the guys, when they come to me, they know they have to sign a standard agreement. If they don't want to, no problem. And sometimes I have to watch good talent, good players move on. Um, but I always stay true to my business principles. Um, but it's commission, how you set up your contract. You need to, uh, as was referenced earlier by, I think, Jonathan uh, and Peter to a degree, um, you need to understand what am I going to be like? What's my business going to be? Just some basics that you talk to yourself and you're focused on how you're going to grow your business. Um, but the players are your assets. And the better you can help those assets to develop. Um, and like Peter said, you've got to be in charge. You're, you're a mentor. And to the younger players, you're almost a father figure to those players. Um, and so you have to, and I always go to work with the same attitude. Somebody's livelihood, I'm in charge of. And if someone was in charge of my livelihood, I would want to know that's a person who is well in control, is well versed, understands the rules and regulations, is surrounded by good experience and expertise. And because that's my livelihood. And that's not a small thing when you have someone's livelihood in your hands and in your control. So you have to have that attitude um, because that will help you to do the best job possible for your players. Um, but with commissions, it will vary, as Peter said, from country to country. Um, at the moment, at the FIFA level, we clearly commission is a big argumentative point. Um, they're trying to enforce a 3 and 3%. That won't happen, of course, at all. We think a dual rep... Um, number closer to sort of England, where you can go to a maximum of five and five percent club and player, is probably a fair and equitable position. Um, but again, sometimes those things will be dictated by countries, markets, um, your own country as to what your players expect. But again, defend your position as a business. Um, so uh, there was a lot of agents that um, that came up and said that they didn't mind the three percent when FIFA put that out there. However, we argued that if you put the commission level so low, A, many agents won't be able to make a reasonable living from that, but you will invite an awful lot of bottom feeders into the marketplace. Because again, I know that if I want to hire a top end of town lawyer, he might cost me 400 pounds an hour, or I can go down the road and I can get a lawyer for 80 pounds an hour. But if I pay the 400 an hour, I know what I'm going to get. If I pay 80 pounds an hour, I also know what I'm going to get. But the decision, I mean, if FIFA put in a bigger percentage range, you as a business operator can decide if you wish to reduce that to whatever level you feel you have to be competitive in your own domestic market. All right, thank you. Okay. I want to talk about Gunawo. You're on. Well, guys, the group of lectures and I've had a lot of great learning experience. My question is this, the commission, what is it on? Is it just on the transfer fee or is it on the whole contract, salary, including bonuses? I just need to be sure. The reason is knowing how we intermediaries and agents operate in Africa, we take a whole lot of responsibility for the players and the cost involved is, is huge. So I would just like to be clear on that. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, again, uh, if you are collecting um, a part of the transfer fee, as Jonathan referred to in his presentation, you are acting for a club, whether a buying or a selling club. Um, currently, you can act for both, as the great Mino Riola shows us many times. Um, so part of the transfer fee would be you'd be acting for a club. And, and as FIFA are currently um, under their guidelines suggesting you can only act for one of the buying or selling clubs. They've yet to determine which. So that is the transfer fee. In general terms, um, certainly most of the representation agreements that I'm aware of, um, people charge on the gross amount of the player's contract. Um, so that would be um, the player's salary, if he had significant bonuses involved that the agent has negotiated, et cetera. Um, some of the less desirable agents um, in the past, historically, not so much nowadays, will go so far as to work out the value of a car if a car was provided and try and take a percentage of that, which I don't even understand how you do that unless you go and remove a wheel from the car. Um, so I think in general terms, it's the growth um, value of, of the player's contract, which contains his salary, his bonuses, pretty much. And again, you can decide whether you, you choose not to charge him um, on his bonuses, whatever. 
again, if it's a young player and he has a goal scoring bonus, it's a good thing for a goal scorer because it's a big incentive for him to score goals. So for a young goal scorer, I, I probably would say, mate, you've earned that, you keep that. Um, if it was Leo Messi and he gets 2 million euros for winning the Champions League, I probably would send him a bill. But then he can afford that bill. All right. Thank you. Chibuza. Yeah, a very big thank you. Very big thank you, Mike, uh, for this uh, wonderful, uh, for this information to be part of this uh, this uh, platform this afternoon. And also a very big thank you to the speakers for all that enlightenment. Um, my question goes to Mr. Paddy. Yeah, Mr. Paddy, I, I was, when you were explaining about the contracts, contracts of player, I was actually off and on because I had another engagement, so I didn't really get that very well. So I forgive me for that. Please, what's, what are the things an intermediary should look out for when trying to sign a contract for a player? What are the most important things we need to look out for? Things like the transfer fee. I only know about the transfer fee, agency fee, commission, and bonuses. If you can just in a few minutes uh, throw more light about that, I'll, I'll be very grateful. Sure. Um, the, one of the big benefits we have nowadays, is, as Jonathan and Peter will tell you um, from their backgrounds, is an awful lot of leagues around the world have a standardized contract. Um, so actually, there's huge portions of the contract that no changes are permissible to. Um, they're just standardized. Um, that basically leaves you with having to negotiate on behalf of your client for the terms um, and conditions that are within that contract. So your main um, points in any contract that you negotiate will be the term, the length of contract. Um, that comes back to what stage in his career your player is at, how long you want to commit that player um, for. Maybe you have multiple goals, multiple plans, and the shorter term contract is better. Maybe you feel it's a club he needs a significant period of time and you want him to be there longer. Obviously the player's salary is the negotiable part that you have to negotiate with a club. Um, and outside of that, um, it's bonuses and, and depending in which markets, depending on the position of the player will depend on, on the bonuses that you negotiate. So if they're, you know, um, if they're goal scorers, you wouldn't be negotiating goal bonuses. If they're midfielders, you look at assists. If they're um, defenders, clean sheets. Um, but effectively, the terms and conditions are carte blanche. You can negotiate whatever you want into those. Um, if they qualify for certain league positions, they can get bonuses. Um, but really, it's the term, it's the player's salary, it's the bonuses, and obviously your own agent fees are negotiable to a certain degree. Um, most of the rest of, of the leagues have a standardized um, agreement that you would then, um, and, and also, in, depending on the country, you may need to get the assistance of a lawyer. Um, because, so, again, all of these things, even with FIFA rules, as Jonathan alluded to before, with regards to England, FIFA has a picture of you get one agent license, and this will be a global license to operate anywhere. Um, however, we know that that won't stand true because member associations will they will change them to whatever their markets need to have in place and um, they'll just they'll tweak them the fundamentals of them will be the same across the board but they, each market will tweak it um, but the standardized contract should remain in each country um, to a certain degree um, and then you just negotiate those terms and conditions within them okay thank you so much thank you so much if I can add something, um, also looking at if you've got a player, a very good player, transfer clause or a release clause or a buyout clause. So um, we know, all know about um, buyout clauses and or release clauses or transfer clauses. When, when another club is interested in the player because he's doing so well, those clauses should also be included in the contract. Um, and different countries have – Spain has a buyout clause – I don't, uh, I don't believe England, you can have buyout clauses, but you can have transfer clauses. So you need to be aware of that in terms of negotiating um, as an agent, especially for players who are doing very well. And that's particularly an area where you need to bring probably lawyers in because you will need yeah. those particular clauses. 
to check yeah. the exact wording of, of those clauses are very important because in many territories, people haven't really checked the wording because they were busy looking at the percentage of the transfer amount. And in the end, they didn't get paid. So you very much need lawyers for those particular clauses in, in terms of buyouts. My last question. My last question is about TPO. I need a little explanation. Sorry, Yakuba, you, you're on mute. We couldn't hear your question. Sorry? We couldn't hear your question. You're on mute. My last question is about uh, TPO. I need a little clarification about it. Third party ownership. Um, yes. third, third party ownership is illegal now. Um, yes. It's basically was mainly used in um, South America um, because clubs couldn't afford to fund all the, all, all the players. So agents used to try to um, have economic rights over players. Um, now it's it, the only, um, there was a transition period. So TPO agreements were allowed to continue, but, but they were, they've been banned by, um, by FIFA. Um, what they were was the agent or another third party or investment party had control of the economic rights of the player. When I mean economic rights, the transfer of the player. That's no longer, um, that's not longer available. So it's something that um, should not be in contracts, definitely shouldn't have been an agent's agreement and um, it's just something you stay clear of. I don't know, Jonathan, if you want to add anything. Um, the FA actually banned it before FIFA. We, in England, they actually had a set of regulations specifically targeted at TPO. Um, as soon as FIFA said it's not permitted, miraculously the FA's document went missing and has never been seen since. Um, unless you keep a copy like some sad people do. Um, but the, the TPO element, even though it should not happen and it is illegal, I think we can safely say, and I think the two guys would probably agree without actually saying anything, is that the ability of third parties, including some agents, to exercise influence over transfers and the, the a player's economic rights is still happening. Yeah. Um, and it's up to people to put a stop to it because, it, for me, it, it's just not right. Um, but I would say as well, there are some regulations still lurking around, like, you know, it, it could be argued, and I get into this debate with, with many people, and uh, we could probably talk about it between the three of us endlessly, that if an agent is getting paid a percentage of the transfer fee by the selling club, and he's had a past association with that selling club, is that not indirectly some form of ownership over the registration? That's, that's to be debatable. Where I have a problem with it is the typical South, South American element where somebody basically controlled the earning rights and the rights of a player, basically own the player, which for me, I find disgusting. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that happened in Fiorentina. I think the new owner came in and then realised any player he wanted to sell, he had to pay an agent part of the fee. It was That was... That was, as you say, a form of third-party ownership yeah, type yeah. rights, but um, um, it's, agents it's, had control of the, yeah the selling of players, which is absolutely wrong. Yeah. Um, but that happened in Fiorentina, I believe, in Italy, in the uh, Serie A. There, there's there's agreement there's agreements littered all over the place where agents will have agreements with chairman of clubs, that or club officials that uh, they have a right to act for the club in the sale of certain players going forward. So the argument is if they have that right going forward, is that not a form of third party ownership? But it, it's not just one country or another. I, I think there's, if people look deeply enough, there's evidence of it throughout many countries across the world with football and whether it be in Europe, whether it be in Africa, whether it be in the Americas, you, it's all over the place, sadly. Yeah, it's fundamentally like Jonathan and Peter say it's wrong and you should avoid it. Um, and 
at certain levels of deals, it will be offered to you as an incentive and a carrot. Um, and then this is where the clubs are very, very complicit. And a lot of the illegal activity that takes place, particularly at the top end of the game, these are all incentivized by the clubs. Um, and so the clubs have a lot to answer for. I mean, agents effectively, we suffer the reputational damage from it, but clubs are the ones who incite a lot of it. And there is um, a huge loophole to um, TPOs, which the cartel at the very top use very frequently, which I've highlighted to FIFA, which will be dealt with in the next sort of incarnation of the rules and regulations. So it will certainly make it tougher, but some of these TPO agreements are, can be as verbalized, never mind even written down anywhere. And you, you can't legislate for that. What you can do is track payments and, and audit and, and ask serious questions. And if you don't get a suitable answer, you can punish the club, you can punish the agent involved. Um, but uh, it, it's from morally, it's just not correct. And if you're doing a good job and, and you're building a good business, you shouldn't really rely on, on that. Yeah, thank you. We are out of time already. Well, Jacob, 10 seconds, please. So please, um, I want to, for the speakers, I want to thank them very much. And I want to, I want them to just briefly um, explain to me how am I going to succeed in the business, in the industry, as a startup agent. <laughs> this has been dead with this morning. <laughs> I, 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 I think we've... Um pretty much given a lot of background on that um if it's if the recording's shared i'm sure you'll get things but basically it's um it's uh, um there are a lot of tips and that what i would say is um if you're a startup agent now there's a couple of um good courses that have come on board and i'm not promoting any courses but patty would know that there's one or two that are available for startup um, agents to know the business. And then there's a lot of things that we talked about, relationship, building your client base, investing in um, travel overseas, and then all the other skills that we, I think we mentioned. Um, but um, I would, I think you need to know, because people forget with the agent business, you also need to know regulations and contracts, even though you may need a lawyer down the track. So one of the new courses, one of the courses available, um, which we probably can, Michael knows about, Michael Sadecki, um, it might be a good start as well. Plus, what we've discussed today, I don't know, Jonathan or Patty might want to add to that. Yes, yeah, Jacob, it's it's hard work, and and you know we've probably said a fair amount of things on here that would probably scare people off wanting to do it. That's not the intention. It's just to make people realise. It certainly isn't easy. Um, it takes patience. It takes hard work. Um, I think it takes passion too. You have to genuinely be passionate. I'm like Jonathan. I started out as a coach. Uh, I'd never, it wasn't any university I could go to and say, I want to queue up for a sports agents degree. Um, so, you know, you need to have passion. You need to have patience. You need to work hard. Um, you're going to hit many, many barriers as you build a business, um, but that's no different to a guy who, start, who opens a restaurant or starts another business. That It's only a question of whether you're willing to keep pushing through each of those hurdles, but you'll come to a day when something really good will happen. And it will. I find in my 30-year career, it generally happens when I'm least expecting it. Out of nowhere, I will get a phone call or an email, and it will lead to something outrageously amazing. And then You'll all have that in your journey being a football agent. There'll be a lot of hard days, but then you'll have a very rewarding day. Um, you know, I, I do it because I take huge enjoyments, particularly taking a young player and being with him through a lot of his career and seeing him step onto a World Cup pitch and play against the, the eventual World Cup winners and know his journey from, you know, a very poor background and all the hardship he went through to get there. I can't get that from an office job if I'm an accountant or something. That's not going to give me that. Um, and I can't put a price on that. And I'm not saying that to seem holier than there, but it's genuinely why I do it all the time because I really do enjoy that aspect of it. Uh, but it, again, for many years at the beginning, I didn't make much money. It was quite tough, um, but I was resilient and, and just kept at it. And, and that's pretty much the message. And like Peter said, there's plenty of courses now available. 
Um, a lot of people are doing, you know, agent classes. Um, you just, you can sign up to those. You can give yourself a bit of a head start by hearing from experienced agents what it took for them to get there. Always understanding the rules and regulations are very important. And, and that's thankfully, and as Jonathan said earlier, that's going to come back in because if you're doing a good job for your clients, you should know the rules and regulations. That's the least a client should expect from his representative is that you understand the rules and regs. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's all of those factors. Uh, but again, it's, it's very rewarding. Michael? So, Dickie, can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, what I'm trying to say is I want to appreciate the three speakers, Paddy from Australia, Jonathan from England, and Peter from Australia. You have done a wonderful job for us today, and we really appreciate it out of your busy schedule, stay up time to share important information with us. And we hope that when next we call you, you're going to be and to the audience, those who are from watching from Facebook, from our uh, the YouTube, and those on online on Zoom. We appreciate you. It's been two hours 30 minutes. We budget 90 minutes, but it's been two hours 30 minutes now. Uh, we want to appreciate you. Our next stop will be on the on the 28th of October, where we'll be discussing the uh, super topic again, I mean, how to establish yourself as a football agent. <laughs> that will be the second episode. So it, it comes up on the 28th of October. We hope Jonathan and Co will be available for us. Uh, in the meantime, we appreciate you. Um, with this, we are going to close this meeting. But before then, in, in 60 seconds, Peter, Jonathan, and Pabi, your parting word in 60 seconds. Peter, you're on. Oh, I'm on. Um, um, what I will say is the agency business, it's a ruthless, tough business, but it gets the most enjoyable business you can be involved in because it brings everything together, whether it's office, whether it's deals, with the stadium, with making people happy. It's the, it is the holistic business and it is a relationship business. And if you can make it and grow in it, um, it's, it's just, it's, it's full of um, great stories. It's full of um, passion, as um, Patty said. And I really hope all, for all the people that attended today to really make a go of it. It takes time. It takes resilience. It takes patience. But it's a journey that, you know, that really can um, um, achieve a lot for not just yourself, but to make lives of other people better. So my best wishes and best of luck with your journey as a football agent. Thank you. Peter. Um, similar story to Peter. I hope what you'll all take away from this, this webinar that we've had is the positive things that we have said. Um, the negative things or the scary things that we've raised, we've raised them to make you aware, not to scare you out of the business. Um, this is, again, for me, I, there isn't another job I would want to do. I've had many job offers in many other places, but I've spent 30 years doing it and I do it because I really enjoy it. And I've had very, very tough times, probably tougher than some of you guys will have, um, but it's very rewarding. Um, Keep your passion high. Be patient with it. Don't give up when you hit some problems. It's it's easy to do that. It's a little bit like what we tell the players, right? Work hard, and when they have downs, they have to come out of those downs quick. And it's no different in the agents' business. So, 
I wish you all every success in whatever you do with your business and what you decide. I'm sure that the more you get into these things and learn, um, the more it will help you achieve success. And I wish you all the best and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, thank you. Jonathan. Right then. Um, I think for me, it's, it's going back to what I said in the presentation. Decide and note down and keep it why you want to do it and the reasons why and what you're aiming to do and then keep it. And you can always refer back to it and you can always refine it because your attitude to the industry, your attitude to other people will change. Sometimes you'll hate it. Sometimes you'll love it. But always stay with what you want to do, what you want to achieve. And as far as those who want to represent players, remember that, you know, you, you are... They are the client and you are the provider. You are the service provider. Yes, you work as a team, but at the end of the day, your focus has got to stay on them. You will end up getting incredibly frustrated with parts of the industry, um, whether it be authorities and regulators, other agents, players who don't do what they say they're going to do, families who turn their heads. All you can do is your best. Um, but as Paddy and Peter have said, there are some huge ups, upside of it and huge lifting motions. And there's nothing greater than when you see a young player who you've worked with make his first first team appearance. It, there, there really isn't. Mind you, there is one thing when they say thank you. And it, it, believe me, it happens from time to time. It doesn't happen often. But when they do, it's well worth it. But honestly, best of luck to to all of you, um, but focus on what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve it. All right, thank you. Uh, at this time, we are going to close the meeting. I appreciate you all. See you soon on the 28th. Like oh, thanks for having you. us, Michael. Thanks, yeah. Michael, for thank having you. us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Right. Bye, hello. everyone. See you again. Soon. Uh, hello, Michael. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Uh, please, can you make the Thank recordings you. available? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, oh. it's available. Thank you. you can check it on my YouTube. It's there now. Or on my Facebook page, Amphilet Sport TV. Jacob, what do you call it again? Amphilet Sport TV on Facebook okay. is there now. Amphilet Link. Okay, have a nice day, okay? Bye. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Yeah, not easy. It's not easy, huh? Eh? Thank you for everything. <laughs> my, my, such a great, such a great work. Well done. Yes, my, well done. Uh, thank you. My name's Sick. At least we okay. did. Well done, guys. Well done, guys. Well done, guys. Thank you so much. It's going to be fresh. Jacob, thank you. Okay, Kejar. Thank you. Thank you. Bro, I hate her. Before you need to work for my player. Get the one. Yeah, I can't wait. We'll call you. I'll call you after we drop off. Okay. Get right, one good player. That's all. Yeah. You know, because... Um, Africa, they like to rush agent. Everybody, when they see new agent, they want to go. So you just have to be careful. Don't care about everyone. Yeah. Choose good player. One good player. Spend all your money on one player, and everything will be okay. I lost yeah. too much money. I lost too much money when I started. I lost a lot of money. I got the first contact I got was a small club. I made only one thousand out of how many thousand I spent. But from there, I spoke with the president of the club. He gave me his confidence. He said me, give one good player and I'll keep asking you for more. You see? That's, so don't is, care about too many. Choose one. One good one. Sacrifice. Then you that can get two. Yeah. That's all. You don't now need I'm five in Asia here. You only need I one. I don't speak to agent. I speak to president. Yaku, where do you stay? I stay in Asia in Vietnam here, but I rule all the Asia. Okay. You understand? Wow.
one player alone, one player will take you where you want to go. So many yeah. agents, you to them, they don't care. They have, it's just like, you need to be jealous of your business. Yeah. Our business is just like when you have a girlfriend, you know you, pretend, you don't want someone to go there. So everybody will protect their environment. They don't want you in. So if you send message for Please. people, why would they reply to you? Why? They have their players. So you, that's what you need is just one. You get one, if you make it, you, you, you start, all you need to do is to package yourself. You package your business. You know, you package yourself to you make your business. Don't care about another agent. Go to club. Start from somewhere. Go to one club. Try to penetrate to see. Oh, God, sleep. Sleep, 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 sleep. Sleep, sleep. Some person talk to him. We can make this. The person. I go, 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 they don't care. They have to be like, they say, 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 they say